Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Tish Milteth, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at .NET New Corporation. I'm very happy to be the host of today's web seminar, Take Your Site Mobile with 51Degrees.Mobi and .NET Nuke. Our speaker today is James Rosewell, founder and CEO of 51Degrees.Mobi. Before we get started, I want to do a few Hello, everyone. Statistics. Oh, thanks, James. <laughs> um, just some quick housekeeping. I want to make sure everyone is comfortable with the web seminar platform. Uh, if you take a look at your control panel, there's a little button where you can raise your hand, quote unquote. And if you could just raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, looks like we're good. And then one more time, if you could use the raise your hand feature and let me know if you can see all the slides. Okay, looks like we're good. So there's going to be a lot of information throughout the webinar. If you have questions at any time, just be sure to use the Ask a Question feature in the web seminar software. Um, we'll take all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, if we're not able to get to all of the questions, we will respond to you via email in a day or two. But we will try to get through as many questions as possible. Before we get started with James, uh, we have several hundred people on the line right now. Some of you are familiar with .NET and Nuke, some of you are not. So I'm going to take about uh, three or four minutes to tell you a little bit about us first. So at .NET and Nuke, uh, we're a software company. We have a web content management system with a bunch of additional capabilities. One common theme that we come across with customers is the problem of business agility. By that, I mean they struggle with doing things faster, doing them more efficiently, as well as affordably, and scaling their business in an environment of unpredictable change. Think back to the year 2000 and what the Internet was like then. At that time, a website was very static. But as you know, in the past 10 years, things have changed dramatically. But who could have predicted the growth in social interactions? Who could have known how absolutely critical mobile devices would become in delivering content? Fundamentally, how we use websites has changed from just a source of information to a place of meaningful interaction anywhere, anytime around the globe. So what we are encouraging our customers and prospects to think about is making the right platform decision that allows you to adapt quickly to that unpredictable change on the web. So again, at .NET Nuke, we are a software company with a web content management system. But there's a bunch of additional capabilities, document management, social, mobile, which we're going to be talking about today. And those capabilities allow our customers to adapt quickly, to move fast, and take advantage of new opportunities for their online presence, making their most valuable business asset, their website, work as hard as possible for them. A little bit about .NET Nuke. Uh, we're the world's number one co web content management system in the Microsoft ecosystem. we just about ready to tick over 2,000 commercial customers, but we started as an open source project in 2002. We are by far the largest and most successful open source project in Microsoft history. And we started selling commercial editions of our product in 2009. It's been a very fast growing business. And as a result, we made the Inc. 500 list in 2011. In fact, we were number 23 out of all software customers, uh, businesses, sorry. Um, .NET Nuke it has, uh, is an open source business. And uh, there are over 700,000 websites around the world that are powered by DNN. Over the years, we've had over 7 million downloads of our software. We also have an online marketplace called the .NET Nuke Store. And there are thousands of modules, extensions, and designs in the store, which make building a website very fast and affordable for our customers. Finally, last but not least, we have a very large and strong community of folks that contribute to the open source project and have a depth of knowledge about .NET Nuke. And they actively participate in continuing the project. 
I'd like to tell you a little bit about a comprehensive study we did with our customers just a couple of months ago. We used an independent third party called Tech Validate, and we had some really interesting results validating the return on investment our customers get from using our product. In fact, 95% of our customers said that they were able to improve their efficiency of both content owners and their IT professional staff. We also had an outstanding 94% of our customers say that they saved time and money um, across by using .NET Nuke. Another interesting statistic, because you know time and money is important, but we're also trying to move fast and be adaptable in a changing environment. And 81% of our customers felt that they were able to deliver faster using DNN versus using any other solution. So very exciting results for us. We feel like we have a very strong offer. And we would like to invite you to learn more about .NET Nuke. Um, we have three different versions. We have our free community edition, our professional edition, and our enterprise edition, each with its own set of features and functions. I encourage you to visit our website and learn more about each of these. So with that, I would like to introduce you to James Rosewell from 51 Degrees Mobity. James, uh, I'd like you to take the reins now and uh, um, start your presentation. OK, let's see if we can make this work. There we go. And the magic happens. There we go. Is my screen up now? Yes. Excellent. So. Hello everyone. Um, just before I get into the detail and start showing code and all that kind of stuff, I'd really like to start by setting a little bit of context uh, for this presentation. So a typical web page has been built for a big screen, a laptop or a desktop. It contains lots of images, lots of links, lots of information. And that doesn't work quite so well on a small screen. Apple led the way uh, with pinch and zoom, scrolling around and things like that. But at the end of the day, the content wasn't designed for that smaller screen. And that problem becomes even worse on very small screens, which are particularly popular in developing countries. So why does that happen? Why does this, where does this problem come from? Well, it's because all websites, generally, most websites, will send the same response to the device, irrespective of what the device is. With 51 degrees enabled, what we can do is bring some intelligence to that website so that it can tailor its response to the device, and that's very much what we're going to be focusing on over the next 30 minutes or so. That allows us to make everyday things possible. Here are some examples of some brands and some websites that use our services. So we've got a couple of uh, credit card companies we're pleased uh, to use 51 degrees, um, whether that's booking holidays or airline flights or booking tickets for concerts. All these websites use that concept of server-side detection in order to tailor their experience. We're used on over 140,000 web servers that we know about around the world, and over half a million devices each month uh, go through our software. Uh, we're growing fast. Now, one of the very popular technologies, standards, uh, techniques that's out there that a lot of people are talking about at the moment is responsive design. So having set that context, I just want to talk about where responsive design uh, fits in. So we consider when you're looking at the difference between a mobile website and a desktop website, a mobile phone I'm talking about here, and a desktop or a laptop website, your traditional website, there are two key dimensions to look at, the page content and the navigation. If the navigation and the page content are the same, so that they're, they're identical, then all we really need to do is alter the layout of the page, um, perhaps rather than laying things out so they appear next to each other, they appear underneath each other in a column. If the page content needs to be altered, perhaps because there's so much of it for the big screen, it would just be madness to try and display all of that on a little screen, then we need to look at altering that page content, perhaps breaking a page down into three sub-pages that are more suitable for the smaller screen device. If the navigation is significantly different, then we're looking at a scenario where the content needs to be shared and at least the impression of presenting separate sites is achieved. So 
where does responsive design, client side, CSS3, all the different names for it, we think that sits down in that bottom left hand cor corner, altering the layout. It's fantastic uh, if that's the kind of use case that you can operate in. However, if you're in those other two scenarios, we think you need to look at using server side technology to alter the page content or present the impression at least separate sites. So just before I move in and look at some code, I'd like to bring up a case study, uh, which is the phonecast.com. Uh, this is a UK podcast. I'm very pleased that I contribute to this most weeks. Um, it's predominantly about podcasting, but it also, um, it also runs a new site as well. And we've recently overhauled this to work with .NET, and you can use the techniques that I'm going to uh, be showing you over the next, uh, next few minutes. Um, so what you can see here on a normal uh, desktop website is a pretty, pretty standard layout. We've got an advert at the top, the primary navigation occurs across the top of the page. Um, there's things that appear to the, to the right of the, of the main content. If I now look at that on a mobile device, this is the same site. We've made a few changes. So the advert is a Google mobile advert as opposed to the normal uh, desktop advert. And uh, the content all appears as one column. And as we scroll down towards the bottom of the page, um, you can see the uh, navigation is split into two parts. So you've got the, uh, some navigation at the top and some navigation at the bottom. So the content's the same, but the layout of the page has changed quite significantly. Now what I've done for the purposes of this demonstration is take the .NET Nuke standard website and made a few alterations to it. Um, so rather than going through the phonecast in its entirety, I'm just going through a kind of smaller version of that, which is based on the standard .NET Nuke uh, installation. So I've cha changed the banner at the top. I put an advert in here. Um, and I think I've done that across a few of the pages. I'm just going to pause for a minute. Um, there's a big rainstorm coming through here at the moment. I just want to check that the background noise isn't distracting uh, from the conversation. Perhaps Tish, you could I just confirm that. I hear the rain or anything. You can't hear that at all. Fantastic. The power of modern microphone and sound technology. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think um, you're good. I'm good. Thank you. I'll keep going. So. Um, I've made a few basic changes uh, to this site, and if I then show that in the mobile emulator, I'm just typing in localhost, and you'll see it's redirected, it's picked up the mobile version, it's taken us to a slightly different version of that standard .NET Nuke uh, website that you can see there. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. So the first thing I want to go through is how we've managed the change to the navigation. So to present the impression of two separate sites. So if I just flick back to, um, oh, let me just flick back to here. Um, the URL um, is localhost mobile and then getting started. So although it looks like a different site, it is still part of the same .NET Nuke um, site. We're just using a different skin for those mobile pages. So the first thing I've had to do is change the primary navigation. So although I've got a mobile page, I don't want it to appear in this top navigation up here. And thanks to the power of a wonderful tool that comes with uh, .NET Nuke out of the box now, um, I've been able to do that by changing the XSLT template that comes with .NET Nuke. So the thing I've done is add this line in, which simply checks to see if the menu item is mobile, and if it is, it doesn't display the menu item. It's, it's really that simple. So that's the only change I've had to make to the standard .NET Nuke template in order to uh, support this impression of multiple sites, simply removing the mobile link from the home page. Um, the second thing I've done is I've had to split my mobile skin uh, into produce two menus. So again, if I flip back, um, and bring that up. There we go. Uh, here. So in my um, user control, uh, what I've got, I'll be going through this code in a, in a short while. Um, I've got my top menu, and I've just told it to pick out uh, two of the menu items. And then my bottom menu, again using the DDR menu control, um, I've been able to get it just to, to exclude some nodes. And that's how I'm setting up the navigation 
uh, at the top and bottom in my skin. So pretty simple to change the navigation both to the primary site and for the mobile site. The next thing we saw there when I used the emulator was the redirection. And there are two ways that we can do redirection. There's the kind of really, really easy way that .NET New provide, and then there's a slightly different way that we provide, that, and the two can work quite nicely together. So just to show you that working, coming into here, let me log in. I'm logged in already. Fantastic. So from .NET, 6, .NET Nuke 615, um, the site redirection management was integrated. And this is provided with community edition and all the commercial editions as well. And what you can do is come in here and set up redirection rules. And what I've done is set up a redirection rule for each of the uh, pages that come with the standard site. So I've got getting started, and that's being redirected to my mobile page there. So pretty straightforward. I've just set up uh, three redirection rules. Um, but uh, it's very, very straightforward, very easy to do within the .NET Nuke environment. The second way of performing redirection uh, is through the 51 degrees uh, sis, uh, redirection system. And what that allows us to do, I'll just flip back to the slide, actually I've got all the code here, um, is do two uh, additional things that are useful uh, in the, where you want to retain the context of the query. So the redirection there was working for a page, but in our phone cast example, if you find the article via a search engine, for example, you don't want to just be redirected to a home page. You want to be able to see that article on a mobile phone. And in order to do that, we use the 51 degrees uh, redirection on the phonecast.com for those more advanced scenarios. Um, so what this code is, is doing here, you can see, read all about this on our website. If you go to documentation, foundation, user guide, you can see how all this works. You can set up a configuration file uh, to make sure that the context of the request is retained. It requires a little bit of experience of regular expressions and, and that sort of stuff, so not necessarily for the faint-hearted, but uh, uh, nevertheless it can be done. The other thing we can set up is there's a parameter with 51 degrees called first request only, and if we set that to true, then it will only redirect the first request. And that's quite important if you want to provide a use, support a use case where the default experience when the user first comes to the site is a mobile one, but you want to give them the option to go back to the standard site um, if you want to. So two differences in terms of the functionality and features that are supported, so two different ways of doing them. One dead easy using a GUI, uh, the other requires um, a little bit more knowledge of regular expressions, etc. Now if I just flick back to the redirection here, you can see that we can control the device that is used for uh, redirection. The same is true with the advanced redirection I was looking at earlier. And with the community edition, the tablet advanced options um, are a little bit limited, um, but we can do something about that. Um, so you'll notice tablet, etc., cetera, are disabled at the moment. What I can do um, is go into the host menu, and there's a menu here called device detection management. And we have a premium product, uh, which we provide to .NET Nuke users via the .NET Nuke store. Uh, you can click in and uh, buy us. Um, if you do that, um, what will happen is you can get a premium data file. You just go in here, upload the file, or you can get your license key and just click activate. All of this is within the core .NET Nuke product. I've uh, just uploaded that file. We click refresh. It forces the worker process to restart the first time it's loaded, um, which is why there's going to be a little bit of a delay. And what that's doing is increasing the number of properties that we've got available. So you can see the current version with community was light. It's now changed to premium. Um, and you can see that's our version from uh, last week. Uh, and there are now 97 properties available that we can use. If I now go back into the admin menu and site redirection, and now look at one of these rules, we can now see these other options have become enabled. And that's quite important if you want to differentiate different types of devices. So if you wanted to just redirect, put a redirection rule in for, let me find hardware vendor, hardware model, 
or choose. Um, you could actually choose, you know, scroll through here and choose iPad if you really wanted to. Um, so the world's your oyster. Uh, when you uh, get the get the premium data, you get a lot more a lot more properties, and pretty easy to to set up. So I've been through premium data. These are my backup slides. So just a quick uh, note on the differences between the two. Uh, the light data is released under the Mozilla public license. It's included uh, for within the community edition of .NET Nuke. Um, it's updated monthly. It contains about 49 properties. We're adding uh, to that all the time, so sometimes these increase slightly. Uh, it's released uh, under the Mozilla public license version too, so very permissive. Uh, the premium version comes with .NET Nuke, uh, the, commu the commercial versions of .NET Nuke. Uh, contains 97 properties, things like its tablet, the physical screen size of the device, what input method is supported, etc. And I'll show you how to use some of those uh, in a minute. It's updated weekly. Uh, there's a bespoke license, so that allows you to white label. Uh, that data within your product. That's exactly what .NET Nuke have done. If you provide professional services, then uh, you can do the same thing. And uh, pricing starts from 64p a day, um, which I think is just under a dollar in um, American money. So that's our licensing. Um, just to show you how one of those other properties can be used, I'm just going to come out of this. And I'm going to come back into Opera, and I'm going to click Refresh. And, ah, oh, no, that's the wrong version. I need to come into here. Um, so what you can do with Firefox is there's a lovely little plugin called User Agent Switcher. And you can get Firefox to pretend to be things it's not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to the mobile site. Now that I've installed my premium data, and you can see that um, the database is telling this particular skin that we don't know whether it's a uh, that it's sorry that it's not a touch screen. Um, if I change this to iPhone and click refresh, you will see that the page has changed subtly. Importantly, the things that uh, the primary things that you can touch just got bigger, and that's because this particular skin has been coded so that it's checking to see if there's a touch screen and if the 51 degrees uh, database contains some suggested link sizes for that particular touch screen and if there are those two things present then it changes the CSS so that the page changes very subtly um, and what we've done is work out what the optimum size is for things that can be touched so you don't get this phenomenon that I certainly find annoying, where you end up inadvertently pressing the wrong thing on the website. That's not, not good for anyone. Better if they can actually navigate to the, the things they want to navigate to. But likewise, if the user is using a phone that doesn't support touch, you don't want things to be so big so that they have to scroll around with a mouse or things like that, particularly uh, the feature phones that um, uh, are still out there. Surprisingly, not everyone has moved to a smartphone yet. Okay. So that's a little bit on uh, some of the advantages of the, the premium data. Uh, the next thing I'd like to move on and talk about is the uh, Google adverts. So uh, I think I've explained that at the top of the page you get a different different advert. That's because the Google advertising system for uh, certainly uh, small screen devices serves the advert uh, from the server uh, rather than a piece of JavaScript. So what we've produced in our very simple skin here is a Google mobile ads module um, very simple user control um, and what this does is simply make the call to Google to request the appropriate piece of HTML to insert in the markup that gets sent back to the device and we turn that on and off in here so all this line of code is doing is saying if it's a mobile device then set the top advert to visible on the mobile skin. Um, and we also have a little spacer, and I do that because I don't want to fill my page with advertising. Um, I want to have a nice little advert that floats at the top of the page 
and you can see as I scroll up and down, it kind of just stays there, reminding people that I like them to click on an advert because that's how I make money on this particular site. Um, I think that's better than flooding the page with adverts. Um, it, it's a lot nicer um, for, for mobile devices. Of course, there's nothing to stop you having, having multiple adverts, but that's just one way of doing it. We make it float at the top of the page uh, using the fixed position. Uh, just find that. So, so I simply, no JavaScript involved, just simply fixing the position uh, of that advert at the top of the page. So I've built that into the skin. Um, I'm sure there's an opportunity for enterprising uh, people to turn that into um, a control and you could actually have it as a module that you can drop into the page and um, you know do a lot more with it for the moment. As I say, I've just created it as a user control that I put onto the page. Um, we also have this spacer. Uh, that is used to shift the page down because the advert floats on top we actually need to shift the page down and I've just done that using a, a div tag that I set to a certain height. So that's a little bit on advertising. Um, the last um, sort of specific bit of code I'd like to talk about is sitemaps. Um, Google as uh, the leading sort of search engine uh, came up with uh, a mobile sitemap and this is a bit of a pain to produce. We ha we did this for the phonecast.com because mobile is so important to us. Bearing in mind it's a podcast about mobile. Um, so we actually went through and produced a custom sitemap in Google Form for the pages that we wanted to uh, include in the mobile search engine. Um, that's, you know, say quite a neat thing to do. Um, Google's getting quite intelligent, um, but maybe worth considering, it, particularly if you've got a, a, a new site or, or something that you really want to push on the search engines, it might be worth making the investment to do that. Unfortunately, it does involve working at the sort of data layer, um, and it's not the sort of simplest thing to do, but again, might be worth considering in your mobile development roadmap. Um, so that's the code. Um, I'd like to move into just sort of three top tips that I've sort of found over the years um, that I'd really like to, to draw attention to. Um, the first is the CSS attribute display none. Um, I see this being used quite a lot in mobile these days uh, where uh, the screen size shrinks and the designer or developer has decided, okay, I just don't want to display that piece of content on a mobile device, on that particular device. So as the screen size shrinks, CSS3 media queries can be used to uh, make this display none start to happen. And the problem with that is the browser is still downloading everything in the background. Uh, so if you use display none to say turn off an image, um, that image is still being downloaded. It's still affecting the user experience. It's still affecting the performance. And I just think generally that's not a good thing to do from an engineering point of view. Uh, better to try and avoid it if you can. If you know that the device is mobile, if you know uh, what the device is capable of, then there really is no need uh, to do that whilst it, it works from a, uh, a visual point of view. It's not the best from a performance point of view. Um, next point, again related to performance, is images. Um, it's all the brow all the uh, modern browsers have this feature to turn off images, and I think it's always worth sort of testing your page with images disabled just to see how it looks, because there's a sort of phenomenon that I sort of see with uh, skins and themes where images are used to see, achieve certain effects, so perhaps rounded corners or gradients or shadows and things like that. And on some pages you can see uh, sometimes over a hundred different images need to be downloaded in order to actually render that page. Now the problem with all those images being downloaded is not only the size of those images the first time the user comes to the site, which is when we want the at least the quickest experience because that's when we want to engage uh, the user on the mobile device, um, it's also the mobile browsers tend to have a lower number of simultaneous HTTP requests they can make at once. Uh, it's typically about four. So uh, the, the download time is increased further by simply the number of images that need to be fetched. Uh, if you can tell that the device is using, uh, can support CSS3 or even take the call that perhaps on the devices that don't, 
uh, is acceptable not to have rounded corners, we'll go with square corners, uh, then maybe use some of those CSS attributes, some of those new CSS features rather than images in order to keep that page weight down and in order to improve the load time. And the final uh, top tip is uh, think about the use case and where it's the, the application, where the website is actually going to be used. Um, a lot of us develop in offices with Wi-Fi connections and with phones that are connected to Wi-Fi. Uh, or I think uh, over in America, you've got LTE now. Um, we're still catching up here in the UK. It's going to be next year before we even start to get to that. Um, so if you've got a great uh, connection, you've got high bandwidth available, then uh, the, the website can perform faster. It's more forgiving of the kind of issues I just mentioned earlier. But if people are going to be using this when they're on the move, uh, if they're going to be, let's say it's a, an application for retail, it's finding stores, it's presenting kind of information that people want while they're out on the move, then it's important that it performs in that context. Um, and so therefore, keep thinking about bandwidth is, is really the key kind of unifying theme of the, those three top tips. So we've looked at uh, how to change the menu, uh, both of the standard .NET Nuke uh, template or a, a traditional skin uh, to remove uh, mobile if you want to do that. I've also shown you how we can create two menus, one at the top of the page, one at the bottom of the page. Um, again, you can uh, you know, get, go to town with that. Maybe there's three or four menus on your page. Um, basic and advanced redirection. So within .NET Nuke, there's the ability to redirect pages. Um, but if you need to retain uh, the context of the query string, the uh, information about what the, the user actually wants, you can do that as well, although it's a little bit harder. Uh, we looked at Google uh, mobile ads. Uh, we also looked at uh, how to make things finger-sized. Um, mentioned mobile site maps, although that's far too sort of in-depth a topic and very specific to the site. And also looked at um, performance. And then just finally from me before we start the questions and answers. Um, we think this is a this sort of huge opportunity around mobile. We're delighted to be working with .NET New. They're one of the first content management systems to uh, integrate this uh, capability across their product suite um, and making it available universally. Um, we think there's a huge opportunity for .NET New partners to provide value-added service to their customers using the combination of .NET New and 51 Degrees to deliver quickly, uh, low risk, uh, relatively low cost, but adding value. Um, to to customers. So um, please do uh, bear that in mind uh, when you're thinking about perhaps some of the commercial opportunities that are available to you. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, thanks again so much for being with us today, James. Um, uh, 51 Degrees at Moby is a great uh, development partner with um, .NET Nuke, and we have really gotten a lot out of the relationship. As you can see, they provide a lot of functionality on top of the .NET Nuke platform. Um, now we're going to go to some questions. And sorry, we're going to have to change really quickly. Okay, so we'll go to the questions now. Um, uh, first, I want to let everybody know that the web seminar will be available as a replay within 24 to 48 hours, usually within 24 hours. Um, and all of you who are on the line will receive an email that will have a link to the replay. You can also go to the web seminar section of our website where you'll find the replay, um, again, maybe before you get the email. Uh, I know several people had asked that they wanted to be able to send this um, or have their developers come and attend this web seminar. So definitely that is uh, available to you. In addition, um, we will be posting the slides. So I had several questions about people wanting to be able to go and grab pieces of code and use them themselves. So you will be able to do that um, once we post the slides as well. I think the slides will come to you via email, right? Yeah, okay. So, um, so the slides will not be posted, but they will come to you on the email. 
Um, I'd also yeah. like to say the the uh, example skin I showed there, um, I'll also be making available as well, and we'll make sure uh, links available for you to to download that. I say it's pretty pretty straightforward, but it allows you to explore in a little yeah. bit more detail than time allows the concepts uh, I've talked about. What a great uh, value add for our listeners today, so um, getting that free skin, so that will be made available to you as well. So let's go to the questions. Um, first question. Hmm, let's see. Uh, there were some. I think that there's a couple questions that you can kind of answer at the same time. One is, can you remind me of the differences between the premium and light data? And then I had it also had some questions like specifically about pricing around that. So maybe you could review that again really quickly. Of course. So the uh, light data is available for free. It's licensed under the Mozilla public license. So um, uh, to memory, I think that's pretty much the same as the .NET New Community Edition licensing. So it's a nice permissive open source license. You can use it commercially. Um, there's uh, not too many gotchas there like uh, some of the others. Um, that contains uh, 49 properties. Um, things like is the device mobile, so is its primary data connection wireless, um, is uh, the screen size in pixels, uh, for example, um, the layout engine that's going to be used. Um, again, I, I can literally talk for hours and hours about this stuff, so um, I've tried to be really disciplined, um, but things like um, uh, this, the way CSS is implemented across different layout engines uh, varies, so fixed position, for example. Uh, works really nicely on WebKit, doesn't work so well on Trident, uh, which is the Internet Explorer and Windows Phone uh, rendering engine. So um, things like that, you know, really useful. That's all in the light version, um, as well as um, data from a project that's only recently been launched by Facebook and the W3C called Ringmark. Um, and what that does, what Ringmark does, is it detects the cap the browser capabilities of a device, and it's rapidly becoming the sort of W3C standard for testing kind of what a, what a browser is actually capable of. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the W3C, um, there tends to be very long uh, RFPs and uh, papers about different standards, etc. Um, to my mind, Ringmark is kind of becoming the, the test suite for those, uh, uh, for those standards. And that data is all made available in the public domain. We suck that in and put that into our light product as well. We're just working with uh, Facebook to bring that all out of beta uh, so that it's available to developers. The advantage, of course, is that uh, rather than using JavaScript to detect the feature every time the user comes to your site, you just use 51 degrees and it's there, and it's a lot quicker, a lot easier to implement. Um, so that's the light version. Uh, it's three months uh, out of date, so it doesn't contain all the latest brand spanking new devices, um, but uh, pretty usable, and it's there in the .NET New Community Edition. Uh, the premium edition is provided in all the commercial versions of .NET Nuke, uh, so you kind of get that out of the box if you go for the, the premium, uh, the professional and enterprise versions of .NET Nuke. Uh, that contains just under 100 properties, things like the physical screen size, whether the device is a tablet, is it a games console, uh, we'll soon be having television uh, in there, again, totally different kind of design concepts that are needed for those things, um, so that's all in there. Um, together with uh, what type of input method. Um, you can find all of the, the differences between the two in terms of properties on our website if you go to products and device data and property dictionary. And importantly, there's a full metadata, uh, uh, all the metadata is there, full vocabulary that explains what all the properties and values do and those that are included in light and those that are included in premium. It's updated weekly. Um, you can configure uh, your system's downloaded automatically, so you, know, uh, you can run it lights out. Um, what have I missed there? And then pricing. So pricing, uh, licensing is done per instance, so it's per copy of the database um, that is being used. So if you have one server hosting a thousand websites, um, you only need one copy, and it's licensed at $360 a year, so just under a dollar a day. Um, We've certainly found uh, where people have been successful is professional services organizations um, <clears throat> where they're uh, billing time and by using 51 degrees uh, you're more productive 
um, and therefore you can uh, have the opportunity, depending on whether you go fixed price or T&M, uh, to generate higher margin on your on your contract. So there's a great value proposition there as well. I had a question. Thank you. That's good. Um, uh, about getting started, they wondered if there was a getting started page on uh, maybe on your website for where people should start to find out more about uh, your solution. So there is for 51 degrees. So you would go to support and documentation and uh, foundation and it will give you an operational summary so it will tell you a little bit more about how the system works. Um, there's a full documentation for, for .NET so we provide this uh, product through NuGet, uh, through CodePlex as well um, so it's available for the, the full um, .NET Spectrum, MVC etc and you'll see those articles on there. Um, there's a little bit on, on .NET Nuke but the approach we've tried to take with .NET Nuke is to build it into the, the graphical user interface when Israel, Sean, uh, myself and the other folks that were involved in this development first started working on this we felt it was really important to make it you know, easy for, for customers to use so things like the redirection uh, etc is all built into the GUI and what we hope starts to happen is that uh, skin developers uh, will take some of these simple concepts and start incorporating them into their skins so uh, end users have a wide choice of of skins and then can deploy them on the pages that are targeting mobile. Gotcha. Uh, another question, um, can you add your own custom device in the light version or can you do it in the paid version? Uh, you can do it in both. Um, so it, again if you go to that user guide uh, you can provide, uh, the device data can be provided in XML form. Um, and you can create an XML file uh, that contains your additional device and you can add that in um, if, you, if you so wish. Uh, the information is there on the, on the website. What I would add is we find that very few people want to go to that, that effort basically. Um, we have, uh, there's a forum on our website uh, which incidentally is uh, all written uh, using .NET Nuke so uh, we were a, a customer and user uh, before we became a before we became a partner. Uh, so there's a question, there's a forum uh, for device data. Um, if you have any suggestions, if you want us to uh, change things, then you can submit it there and, and we'll do it for you. So most people prefer to go down that route, but there is that option if you want. Great. Um, I had another question that I wanted to ask. Oh, I had a couple of questions about the Firefox extension. Oh, yes. uh, that you're using for testing. So what was the name of the Firefox extension you were using to test in multiple it's, browsers? It's called User Agent Switcher. Um, so if you type that into um, the Firefox add-ons uh, website, um, it then appears as a little icon uh, in the top right-hand corner, and then you can use that to, to change the user agent. It's just a neat way of just immediately seeing what the differences are. Um, with mobile testing, again, we could do a whole kind of web seminar on that. Um, there really is no substitute for, for uh, using the, the real device. Um, mm. And there are uh, people out there that uh, provide them uh, over the internet. Perfecto Mobile um, is one. Uh, device anywhere is another, but they can they are they are quite expensive. Um, but you might want to consider uh, having access to the major browser uh, engines that are available. So um, uh, you know iPhone, uh, Chrome, Android, BlackBerry, etc. Depending on your your target market. Gotcha. Um, speaking of different devices, um, how do you all determine um, what new devices to include in the data set? How does that all work? <laughs> um, well, we have a, a, a process that we run weekly. So we get data from vendors, browser vendors, operating system vendors, hardware vendors. Um, we get all that information. Uh, we have a team of people um, that run this process every week. Um, so we're consolidating all these um, uh, thousands, sometimes millions of data points. Um, we're bringing them together um, and then we produce the, the data file 
in its light and premium form. So the premium data file is about 1.2 megabytes in size at the moment. Um, I like to remind people that that would fit on an old-fashioned fa floppy disk, so we're not talking about big databases, although internally we have uh, quite a lot of data that we have to, to uh, crunch through, and we make that available uh, so to premium customers weekly and uh, via CodePlex, and I think the .NET Nuke team pick up on it when, when they do their maintenance releases, uh, the light version on a monthly basis. Um, so there's quite a sort of, I mean, the, the sort of real sort of, I guess, sort of challenge in the creation of 51 Degrees is working out that process, how to do it reliably and uh, and accurately. But um, uh, we're pretty good at it now. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got an interesting question. It's kind of a, a, a theoretical question for uh, for the audience, but for this specific person, they've got a specific situation. They said, We've got a site with over 15,000 pages, and we're leaning towards not using a responsive design because of performance, browser support, table, and image restrictions. The downside is we'd have to duplicate any data we want to use in our mobile mobile site. What would your recommendation be on responsive versus separate site? Uh, well, in that particular situation, it sounds like the the most important thing. Uh, so it's all about priorities. The most important thing to avoid is uh, having duplicate content um, because that's going to be really difficult from a from a maintenance point of view. If um, if I take our new site, for example, the phonecast.com, um, we don't want to have to write two versions of each blog, one for mobile and one uh, not for mobile. So um, I guess the first question is that the current content that you've got, the actual content that would sit within the .NET new module, kind of how mobile friendly is it? If it's just made up of um, you know, some P tags and some images and stuff like that, then it will probably transition quite well to mobile. It just needs to be put into a different skin. Um, so then the question is, well, how do we, how do we share that content? Now, we used um, on the phonecast.com easy DNN news, um, and that particular uh, company that the, the module uh, Easy DNN News um, allows us to share the same content on multiple pages. So that was a very deliberate choice to allow us to uh, use that content on on multiple pages, so that we just maintain it maintain it once. Um, so that leads me to the sort of next question: with well, how's the, how's the content stored at the moment, and can it be converted into um, a management system that allows it to be deployed onto multiple pages into multiple uh, modules. If it can, then the techniques that I've described will work uh, very well. Um, again, responsive design might work for the bigger screens, so tablets, for example. Um, the key thing uh, I find with tablets is websites that have hover menus. Um, they just don't work on tablets um, because we don't have the concept of hover. Um, and even when uh, the technology does change, so you can have hovering a finger over a, a menu, um, not all the tablets are going to support it. That's going to be a high-end high -end feature, the, the finger hover uh, capability. Um, so what you might find if you're targeting tablets uh, is whilst you can keep the, um, the general kind of look of the, the site the same, certain concepts might need a little bit of tweaking. But again, I would hope, if, in, if .NET Nuke is being deployed properly, uh, uh, then that you can do that through the skin as opposed to actually changing your content. But if you're going to the, for the smaller screen devices that sit in the palm of the hand, um, then it's probably quite a different skin. Um, but I would try and find a way of keeping your content in the same content management system without having to have two separate versions of content especially if you've got, was it 1,500 pages? Yeah, 15,000. 15,000, there, oh, there you go, another zero. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of duplication, so um, I would say if I was the, uh, you know, working on that, try as hard as you can to find a way of sharing that content and just deploying right. it into two different pages, one with a mobile skin, one without. Great, so uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, let's, uh, this is something that might be very helpful for people. What development environment configuration would you recommend for mobile web development? Uh, an environment that's connected to the internet um, because <laughs> uh, 
uh, because you want to be able to access your development environment when you're on the bus on the way home or in the car or on the train as long as you're not driving in the car um, I just want to make that clear safe mobile use please um, so yeah you want to be able to access it when you when you're out and about while you while you're developing um, you know see how it's performing so uh, all our development environments are um, we, we use uh, Hyper-V um, and we run our development environments um, as it, within Hyper-V and then we have those uh, connected to the internet using uh, NAT. Um, so uh, we all have our own web addresses for our development environment and um, that really helps speed up development. Um, so that's probably the, the kind of top, like most important tip for the development environment. Um, of course, there are people in big corporations, and um, there'll be security people who are rolling their eyes and going, "Well, we could never, never do that." Um, it doesn't kind of make it wrong to request it, though, and to try and put the the, the case to do it because it does really help with with productivity. Um, if you can't do that, um, having uh, access internally, so you, at least you can connect to a Wi-Fi network and still connect your in development environment from a real phone, um, that's quite important. Um, have a look at the emulators as well. Opera Mobi is quite a good emulator, but not everyone uh, uses Opera. Um, so using uh, the uh, Google's uh, Android SDK is a, is a very good SDK. It, it needs a lot of CPU and a lot of memory, so you, you don't want to deploy it on a weak <laughs> development environment. But that's quite good, very representative of Android phones. Um, unfortunately, Apple um, certainly on a Windows environment don't have um, an emulator and the, the ones that claim to be emulators are really just a, um, a skin, an iPhone skin uh, running WebKit uh, and Safari underneath um, which kind of is it's okay but it's not going to be quite the same as the real thing. Okay. So we've sort of come to the end of our time. We do have a, a lot more questions. I just want to assure everybody we will um, we will respond to each question. Uh, we'll just distribute them to the appropriate person to get back to you. And again, the web seminar will be available in 24 to 48 hours on the on the DNN website, and you also receive the replay and presentation via email um, in your thank you email. So again, thank you for attending today, and a big thanks to 51 Degrees Button Moby and um, James, James Roswell for being with us today. Well, thank you all for your time. I hope it's been informative. I look forward to your feedback. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.